I I'd, I'd read most of this uh, in a Great Books of the Far East class in undergrad, so I wasn't even in a philosophy context. And I wanted to do some Taoism. and we got some requests to do some non-Western stuff, and I read through the Tao Te Ching, the Lao Tzu one, which is, again, the possibly earlier and maybe more foundational text, and had a really hard time finding any assertions in there for us to discuss, as opposed to just, what does this mean? Like, we could spend the whole time just going through it line by line. What, what, what could that possibly mean? But it came off more like what you would imagine a religious text being, which is hard to do a philosophical evaluation of. Here, at least, though there is some of that, there seem to be some ideas that I at least could get more of a handle on. Things about truth, about the relation of uh, language to facts. Certainly his ethics, insofar as there's an ethics presented here, maybe we should say approach to ethics, I can see a lot of parallels to the, the way Nietzsche talked about it that we talked about in the last episode, where it's kind of hard to figure out sort of what the positive thing is, but you know there are a lot of very distinct negative things, and uh, especially kind of the more you read, even if one passage is confusing, there are themes that bubble up that you can get a general sense of what kind of life is being recommended. It's a really interesting theme. I think maybe it's maybe worth kind of looking at for a moment. The relationship of philosophy and theology or mysticism or spirituality, or you can give these various names to that sort of compartment of stuff. And I guess it does really seem different to me. I mean, I, before I sort of studied Western philosophy, I did spend some time with some of this stuff in another time in my life. But there's something about it. It's, it's a little different than the way if you read maybe Augustine or, you know, these Western, obviously very theological philosophers and to some extent, you're kind of confronted with this whole question about the existence and nature of God and what we might be able to say about that and so on. But you can kind of divorce those questions, at least we've learned to do it in the West, it seems, and sort of just concentrate on the so-called philosophy part and talk about metaphysics or whatever. And it is a sense in which I feel that when looking at these texts, especially the Taoist texts, less so the Confucianist texts or the Moist texts or these other schools in the in the East, but especially the Taoist text, there's no getting away from the fact that to do Taoist philosophy, and I put little quotes around that, is also to engage in Taoist spirituality, Taoist theology, Taoist mysticism, that you probably can't finally separate these themes when looking at either Chuang Tzu or Lao Tzu or any of these texts to make any sense of what they mean. I read a lot on mysticism at some point in sort of early undergrad and was interested in it as a potentially different avenue of getting knowledge. That is, that I read a couple things that said, you know, there's this mystical experience that even though it's described in different ways by different religions, it seems to be like a specific psychological experience that a lot of folks are referring to from different traditions. So maybe there's some, oh, maybe I should check this out and experience my oneness with the cosmos and that kind of stuff. I didn't see, I mean, you could say that some of the crazy stuff that is said in Chuang Tzu maybe is a, as a result of having this mystical experience, but it doesn't seem like that's the focus. It's not, you know, just go fast and uh, put yourself in these extreme physiological situations until you have this experience of God, and then you have an insight that nobody else has. Do you see that in here, or is do you need that even to get what the philosophy is here? I guess I, I do. I mean, I do see the references here. There are references to uh, Taoist alchemy. For example, this is uh, a line from section two, say about nine paragraphs from the top. A quick look. The hundred joints, the nine openings, the six organs all come together and exist here as my body. And that reference there, for example, I mean, there's a philosophical point being made about what are the relations between the parts and the whole, you know, what's the boss part, what is the sort of defining part. But in addition, I mean, that this is a reference to a whole pile of kind of alchemical and medical texts and stuff. And maybe this is also kind of a background thing on this Taoism thing that, I mean, the Tao means the way, but before that was even really discussed as the way, you know, the scholarly tradition had many ways, you know, medical sciences, all these different sciences. And then there was an attempt did to they, bring Did these, they call it the Tao? Did they use the same Chinese word? I think word? the word means way. So, yeah, right. it's like, you know, they had the Tao of this and the Tao of that and the Tao of 
D and the Dao of Da and so on like that. And so, but what about, you know, the really big Dao that pulls us all together? You know, in fact, the emphasis on methodology, like the sciences, it's almost like saying Taoism is like the sciences or something, you know, akin to that. This is sort of a really kind of good background thing. I'm sounding like I know what I'm talking about. Let me assure you that I, <laughs> I at best <laughs> one quarter know what I'm talking about. But anyway, but I would probably say it because I have actually made this mistake in the past where I then was engaging with people who actually did kind of know what they were talking about. And I was interpreting texts in a certain way. And then I'd point out something and say, oh, well, you see, these metaphors, in a way, actually have literary significance, you know, really major literary significance to some other collection of texts or thinking or thought and so on like that. And we're going to miss all this, you know, for the most part. But maybe Except it helps just so to be aware we that have, we know is there. Oh, sorry. We have, some, we have some nice footnotes, at least in my written version. I know there are numbers in the online version. Are they actually clickable? Did you anybody look at the footnotes? I tried <laughs> and failed. No, I had to print it out and read it on the plane. No, no footnotes for me. Yeah, I didn't find the footnotes. I mean, I, they're not clickable and I didn't find them. So, I mean, great. Super. <laughs> the man of footnotes cannot be a sage. That's, uh, <laughs> That's right. right. What, what, what are footnotes doing in Taoist tag here? <laughs> <laughs> we don't need footnotes. Fuck the footnotes. <laughs> a couple things. So one is, I think you sold me a bill of goods because I think you actually said this was going to be about wisdom and you already started off with uh, religion and spirituality and all that. But this seems to me to be a particularly difficult reading to just jump into precisely for the the reasons that Eric just sort of indirectly cited, namely that it feels like there's a tremendous amount of context around this that would be useful to have. And at the same time, I suppose, given that there are many places in the text where they tell stories that I assume are meant to be instructional, I, I'm not sure what the right term is, not allegorical, but you, you know, you tell the story about so-and-so being at a funeral and acting inappropriately. And then everybody says, oh, well, why is he acting inappropriately? And the wise person says, what are you talking about? He's doing exactly the appropriate thing. And you're supposed to say, oh, well, I guess I should question my concept of appropriateness. Would that be a, a homily? That's a good question. I, I don't know. Word? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know what a homily is. Me neither. <laughs> Remind us, please. <laughs> don't they call them... Like in Zen, the koans, like what is the sound of one hand clapping where you're supposed to say, oh, gosh, that's confusing. And yet it's supposed to spur thought. A lecture or discourse on a moral theme. That's a homily. Well, that's not really a story. Yeah, anyway, it, there's a lot of things that I can say about my experience reading the text, but they're very piecemeal. So I'm hoping that they will come up and there will be some coherence that gets brought to them at some point. The one thing I can say is this, and then I will shut up for the time being. I predicted that there would be a line in here that said something like the way that can be shown is not the true way before it happened. <laughs> so I felt pretty proud of myself on that point. <laughs> I think that's maybe a, a really good starting point in terms of actually getting into the meat of the text, because this is, at least from what I've seen, the, one of the most important concepts of Taoism, as opposed to any of the other Chinese schools, and maybe almost any of the Western philosophical traditions it's a can i make a little reference a little one our little reference is okay if i please go uh, ahead i mean i'm such a lame philosopher i use you just have to explain what like you're that. talking about That's okay all. well you all can right. refer I'm, to something as long as you say what it means as right. opposed to just referring to it and moving on well you know cambridge has this little encyclopedia of philosophy and you can look up you know all kinds of terms and get a quick overview of things and they refer to philosophical taoism in a very interesting way and it bears on a lot of the metaphysics that we do in the West. But Taoism takes the position that there really is a metaphysical reality. So they're realists on one hand, but they're very different in that they are semantic anti-realists, so that they do not regard the ultimate truth of the universe as something that can be explicitly uttered. And this creates, I think, a really interesting position that I haven't seen really explicitly laid out anywhere else, where on the one hand, you know, they thus try to do philosophy in the interest of coming closer to the truth, but full on recognizing that every attempt that they do to do this with words, with language, will necessarily fail. And that that line that does show up, and I also noted it, and it's also famously the first line of the Tao Te Ching, which huh. is, I guess, probably the one, I mean, it's really remarkable if you think about this from the point of view as a religious text. You know, the very first line says, you know, 
the Tao of which we speak is not the true Tao. In other words, everything that we're going to say now is not really the truth. It's rather modest, um, remarkable, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So always, this struck me as a very, very profound point about Taoism and an extremely important point of maybe of departure for understanding anything that's going on here, that the relationship of what the enterprise of doing, say, philosophy and what it is you're trying to talk about and appreciating the enormous gulf between them in a way. Anyway, let me, let me so, just stop. So that. is he just being a kind of... No, he's being Wittgenstein. <laughs> I agree. Um, more Was well, that's got to be name dropping? Wait a second. We're referring to past, <laughs> yes, past I'm episodes. I'm referring to a past oh, episode, see, which, is, see, which is allowed. See. Because... <laughs> Because uh, <laughs> for Wes, at least, everything, everybody's some version of Kant, right? <laughs> Unless they're just wrong. <laughs> Everybody who's right is some version. Oh, that's good. I can't have to think about um, that one. Huh. In yes. that, there's a certain sphere that, that is beyond, well, explicitly examination by rationality and science. Well, uh, I, I think this is, uh, I mean, in this case, I think it's just a form of uh, ultimate skepticism, right? Right, that seems to be the focus of a lot of this chapter two here. I had to skip over chapter one because chapter one just seemed to be a lot of metaphors to say, this wisdom is so cool, it's so much cooler than you could understand. And then <laughs> and that's like the whole, <laughs> the whole thing. So let's just skip straight to number two where some of the actual ideas are given. All right, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and take a novice stab at some of that stuff that's in section two, kind of the first part around language. So sticking with this theme of language, it seemed to me that one of the messages was if you're focusing on things and the way things relate to each other and the way things are different from each other, you're missing the point. And that the suggestion was that language really is a tool that enables differentiation. There's a point in there where this translation anyway uses the word attribute. If you focus on attributes and... To use an attribute to show that attributes are not attributes? Yes, and he talks are, about a state in which about? this and that and truth and falsehood <laughs> isn't a thing that's true, also false, isn't a thing that's this, also that. The implication was, from my perspective, that language was basically designed to separate the world into this and that, true and false, and give things names and attributes and, and functions. And that the first message of the text is, you need to forget that. I'll just read the quote. So the section is called Discussion on Making All Things Equal, just for the listeners. And I think it starts the, a couple paragraphs earlier. Right Words are not just wind. Words have something to say. But if what they have to say is not fixed, then do they really say something or do they say nothing? People suppose that words are different from the peeps of baby birds, but is there any difference or isn't there? What does the way rely upon that we have true and false? What do words rely upon that we have right and wrong? How can the way go away and not exist? How can words exist and not be acceptable? When the way relies on little accomplishments and words rely on vain show, then we have the rights and wrongs of the Confucians and the Moists. What one calls <laughs> right, the other calls wrong. What one calls wrong, the other calls right. But if we want to right their wrongs and wrong their rights, then the best thing to use is clarity. Everything has its this, everything has its that. From the point of view of that, you cannot see it. But through understanding, you can know it. So I say that comes out of this, and this depends on that, which is to say this and that give birth to each other. That's probably enough for now. <laughs> it goes on for another three pages like that. Good choice of passage. Is that a Fresh Prince song? Jeez, Fresh Prince. You going, in, you going into the Parents you just going don't into the understand. West for this reference. <laughs> Parents just Parents. don't understand the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. I just like the peeps of baby So parents. could you guys understand if I interpret that as saying, if you spend your time thinking about this differs from that and this causes that, but not realizing that actually this is the same as that and, and this cause and effect relationships are a mirage. That's what I was reading into this. So why is it a mirage, though? Look, I don't know. It's not would, really even would, stating it. It's just kind of throwing out a bunch of questions, <laughs> right? I would challenge a slight and mirage. I think is the wrong word, and this is a, sort of, in a way. Let me get this. I mean, I'm just putting this out there, but it's not so much that words are false, but that they don't tell the whole story, and they're kind of a perspective. And there's a lot of relativism and Taoism that will come up again and again and again. So to see the relationship between this and that and what the words are that are doing this distinguishing and stuff is not to tell the whole story. And not to tell the whole story is not to see clearly 
sort of the whole picture. And I think that's where this reference to clarity comes in, that there's a, a meta level, which is non-linguistic, uh, 